Working Cows Podcast, episode 273. Welcome to the podcast that gives producers a platform to discuss and share paradigm-challenging practices. Practices that have increased the effectiveness of their operation and the joy that their families have received from this lifestyle. Howdy, everybody. This is Clay Connery, host of the Working Cows podcast, and this will be my last episode powered by the Global Ag Network. Uh, just wanted to say, uh, been a good run with the Global Ag Network. Really appreciate Delaney and uh, the rest of the crew over there at the Global Ag Network and all of their work over the years, uh, opening up new partnerships and opportunities and networks and all those things that they've done. Um, just want to try some new things and try some different things, try some different ways of, of developing partnerships and relationships. So I'm going to jump off here uh, after the new year and, and start with some new, uh, uh, start exploring some new opportunities and new ways to develop these relationships and partnerships in the industry. And so I'm, I'm no longer with the Global Ag Network as of next week, but uh, nothing else will change other than that brief little moment of an intro. Uh, hopefully, Lord willing, on, on the Working Cows podcast, everything will stay the same. So uh, you'll still be able to find us at the same spot. Just make sure you're subscribed and you shouldn't notice any change. If not, if you do notice a change, you can always go back to workingcows.net and find us there. Uh, one other thing I wanted to call attention to, I had a, a well-credentialed, very nice letter from somebody who reached out to me to let me know that they had some concerns about la- last week's guest. And I guess the only reason I say anything about it at all is just, to, or not last week's guest, uh, it was more about the topic. Uh, and the only reason I say anything about it at all is just to say, um, you know, as far as the Working Cows podcast is concerned, I do very little research. I might listen to an episode with a guest on another podcast to make sure I'm not asking them the same questions they always get asked. But other than that, uh, this is a side hustle for me and I, I don't do a lot of extra research on these topics, but what I will say is, uh, caveat emptor, buyer beware, do your own homework, find out if it's something that's right for your operation, test it small. If it makes a difference on a small scale, maybe it's something you can make bigger, but that's about all I guess I'm going to say about that. I really appreciated the tone of the letter and, and the, the credentials that came with it. Uh, but uh, other than that, I just want you guys to know, uh, do your own homework and, and figure out for yourself. So uh, today on the podcast, I'm very excited to be joined once again by Zach Smith. Zach, uh, as you know, has been a guest multiple times. We've talked mostly about uh, his venture with the stock cropper, but today we're going to take a different approach. We're going to take a different angle. We're going to talk to him about some of what he sees uh, kind of on a macro scale within uh, agriculture in America as it relates to crop insurance and the farm bill and some of those things. He had a, a recent video that he put out that really resonated with me. Uh, the farm bill has been somewhat of a mis- mystery to me. The uh, crop insurance as a as a grass farmer from west of the 100th meridian has been somewhat of a mystery to me and so i have uh asked him to come on and help me understand it a little bit better but also uh to talk about some of the things that he'd like to see done differently as it relates to uh people being able to get qualified for crop insurance and some of those things as far as moving large scale change is concerned in american agriculture so uh, with all that being said, Zach, thanks for joining me once again on the Working Cows podcast. Welcome back. Thanks, Clay. Great to be here again. Yeah, so I really appreciated the uh, the video that you put out. I really appreciated the perspective. Uh, you know, I, um, as I said in the intro, I, I have a little bit of a limited perspective, I feel, uh, as far as how what the mechanics of all of these things are as far as the farm bill and crop insurance um, those things are changing a little bit for people west of the 100th meridian with things like uh, PRF insurance and and some of those things uh, but it's I don't think it's quite uh, as ingrained in in and in intertwined with the su- success of uh, western operations the the crop insurance uh, isn't quite as ingrained and in, intertwined with the success of western operations as I feel like it is 
of those east of the 100th meridian. So I guess, would you say that that's an accurate understanding of, of the role that crop insurance plays? Is it a pretty critical key piece for people east of the 100th meridian in your understanding or your perspective? Yes, it absolutely <laughs> is. So, um, you know, just to give folks that maybe don't understand the farm bill a little bit of background, every five years, uh, the Congress gets together and uh, votes on the direction of, you know, farm and food policy moving forward for the next five years. And uh, it's a significant bill. I think uh, in 2018, I did a little research ahead of this. It amounted to about $430 billion of a total funding package to cover the farm bill over five years. Most of uh, the farm bill or the most of the proceeds go toward the uh, uh, supplemental uh, nutrition uh, program that most people know as SNAP or what, what used to be called food stamps. Um, and so it's like 75, I think, percent approximately goes there. And then the other 25 percent of uh, the funding bucket gets split um, you know, primarily towards, uh, commodity, uh, commodity backing programs for overall farm risk, uh, conservation, uh, programs to help farmers figure out how to install, you know, conservation methods on the farm. And then last but not least, uh, crop insurance. And so when you get, uh, east of the hundredth meridian, uh, more into the corn belt, crop insurance is a relevant thing for, I think what I've read is like somewhere between 85 to 90% of producers carry it. Um, and it's, uh, and it's very, very relevant, especially when you're in today's day and age with the amount of dollars that you're handling, uh, and dealing in, you know, uh, weather conditions where you're going from, you know, extreme flooding to extreme drought within, you know, 12, 18 months and the risk on the table, it's a lot of dollars to handle and crop insurance is a very, very important, uh, part of, you know, corn and soybean farmers and uh, other commodities as well. And, you know, the, but the farm bill, uh, as a whole, really shapes the policy for what farmers are going to do. And uh, so what do I mean by that is that, you know, the government gets together and they figure out, uh, along with industry and lobbyists, you know, what is what are the important things? And, you know, over the past 50 to 75 years, that overall general direction has been we need to grow a lot of food uh, as cheap as possible and have a cheap food supply. OK, and so that's been a great thing in a lot of ways, because if you look at the the share of uh, an American's budget and what percent has gone to, you know, the food that they buy at the grocery store over the last hundred years that's gone down uh, from, I think at one time in the, during the great depression, it was like over 20%. And now I think uh, in modern times here, I think it's gotten down to 10 or less uh, per, uh, percent um, of your you know family's annual budget goes to food. And while that seems like a great thing, um, you know, there's also the, there's been a big cost in my opinion to that policy. We're, we're extremely efficient. There is nobody better than the American farmer at growing lots of stuff. We've developed an industry that helps us figure out how to do it, even in the face of, uh, you know, in, increased weather risk and, and all sorts of other things we, we keep, keep producing. The, the concern and the reason for my tweet the other day is, though, um, we failed to realize a lot of the other outside external costs that come along with that cheap food production. Um, like, for instance, the, the fact that we've lost, you know, uh, almost half of our topsoil um, and organic matter over the last 150 years of breaking the, the prairie. And uh, that's concerning. You know, if you're any student of history and you see why agriculture or why civilizations fail, it's because their agriculture fails. And uh, so that's that's an alarming thing. We see water quality concerns. You know, we have the the uh, zone of hypoxia in the Gulf of Mexico. We have, uh, you know, the nitrate removal plant in Des Moines, Iowa, that has to be run and, and funded by taxpayers to, to do. And then we, we look at just overall human health. You know, I, I went to the grocery store for my wife last week and you look around at just the, the status of what people look like, you know, because we are the product, right, of <laughs> of the food system. And, you know, you look around and people look tough. People, you know, we don't look like a healthy population. And so while I, I think a lot of people in agriculture stand up and say, you know, we are fantastic because we've made all this cheap food. We've made a lot of cheap food. But what else? And those are the things um, that, you know, 
are really driving me now and why I tweeted that out and some, some of these ideas specifically around how do we address and use food policy to f- actually do something meaningful about the externalities that we've ignored for a long time. Right. You know, and, and that government setting the policy, you know, I, 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 I kind of went down this libertarian rabbit hole in, in 2016 and stayed down there for quite a while. And uh, I've kind of come back around, but still real on the real limited government side of things as far as what, what works best. And, and that government setting the policy, they are the ones who have the monopoly power. They are the only ones with a monopoly, monopoly of force. And so when they say this is what you're going to farm, where you're going to farm it, and how you're going to farm it, people snap too because they have put their their thumb on the scale and said this is how we are setting policy this is how it's going to be and so people don't get the opportunity to make a uh, a decision without taking that into consideration and so it changes the way that things get done uh in in all kinds of places. And so, I mean, have you, have you experienced that in, in your life as far as there are things that we would try that are outside the box, but, uh, it's, it's not really feasible because the government has a a certain way that they want things done and in a certain place that they want those things done. Yes, absolutely. Well, there's definitely security that it provides around, you know, what we've deemed to be safe for, for producing in, in the eyes of uh, the industry and the government. That's the case, but it does limit innovation and it does, it does limit access uh, to new players into the game. And, uh, and I don't, I, you know, I don't think that's uh, I don't think that's a good thing. It's very difficult, you know, to go and get financing if you're going to do something uh, you know, through a bank that is not uh, insurable or not an insurable practice from crop insurance. You know, we, there's been things specifically around some of these soil conservation things like um, using cover crops that there have been some key people that have really went to bat and fought hard uh, for things like concepts like relay cropping, um, you know, where we, they had to go to bat against RMA, uh, the, the government entity that, that uh, governs crop insurance to to be able to include some of these new things. And it's it's uh, it's good that some of those things have happened, but there's a lot more innovative uh, things that are going to be coming down the pike that uh, we need to be more nimble or more open to uh, to to having come into the fold here. So. Right. And it's not necessarily like these in innovative practices are a sacrifice on our ability to produce a quantity of food either. I mean, like we are hopefully producing better quality food too, right? You talked about the negative externalities as far as cheap food is concerned and, and a trip to the grocery store and seeing uh, what's in people's carts and then the people that are pushing those carts and say, oh, that there's a a link there between those two, those two things. Uh, but it's not like you have to sacrifice the quantity of food you can produce if you're going to take a soil health approach and produce higher quality of food, quality food. Would no, you agree it, with that? In, in my opinion, absolutely not, because I'm somebody that's been utilizing, you know, some of these practices. I don't do everything perfect. There's and I, there's things I can uh, do on my farm. But the idea that we cannot produce things and incorporate these practices is nonsense. I mean, we, just this last week, they re- released the National Corn Grower Yields. And uh, I think overall, um, you know, if you're comparing just tillage systems, conventional tillage um, versus strip till versus no till, I think strip tillage actually... Uh, was the number one overall average yield when you look across all the states and no till i think there was an entry where a guy grew like 325 bushel corn with uh, with no till that entered that contest and i also believe there was a gentleman out in north carolina by the name of russell hedrick that uh, I, I read a news article that apparently set the non-irrigated uh, u.s uh, dry land record uh that was previously held by francis childs uh at 400 and uh, 59 bushels an acre that he grew out in North Carolina. And he, you know, he's not using conventional ag practices. So the idea that we're all going to starve, uh, in my opinion, is nonsense. Now, are there risks to some of these changes? Absolutely. Just like there are risks in any system. Okay. There's lots of risks in conventional production and things that can go wrong. It's just that when you're the, uh, you know, when you're one of three or four village idiots in a, in a locality that are doing things that look different, 
people tend to latch on to when you have failures more than when the herd has a failure. And so that, uh, I think fear has more to do with it and not, and, and, and the fear of going through that kind of uneasy process of change, but we can't live in that state perpetually and keep using apathy, you know, well, we've always done it this way. So this is the way, you know, we're going to keep doing things. That's not moving us forward and, you know, and, and actually making progress and addressing some of these other things that really do have a long-term a uh, threat at our ability to sustainably produce food. I'm not talking today or tomorrow or next year. I'm talking, you know, 60, 70, 100, 150 years down the down the road or the time frames I'm talking on here. Right. Right. And and we all hope to have uh, you know, grandkids, great grandkids, great great grandkids running around at that point. And so are we going to leave them uh, with a better world than than we inherited from our ancestors, you know, and are we going to leave them with a better uh, set of opportunities than we have received? Are we going to hand it off better than we found it, you know? And and I think some of the things you've been touching on here are ideas that are contained in David Montgomery's book Dirt, and in that book he talks about the fact that uh, basically when a soil when a when a civilization's soil structure collapse not far behind it is the collapse of that civilization's structure itself. And so uh, where we are seeing, uh, you know, the number one export of U.S. agriculture being topsoil by some metrics, you know, depending on who's measuring, who's counting, uh, we're seeing these, these things happen in our lifetimes. And they are not all our own fault. There's been generations of decisions made and they were doing the best with what they had, but there's there's consequences, and now we are also seeing opportunities uh, based on our understandings of underground microbial life to make those things better and to to you know regenerate those soil structures in some le- on some level, and so we've got new information. We have to make new decisions and and uh, go in a new direction. But it takes a long time to turn a big ship. And uh, American agriculture is a big ship, but I think that you have put forth some ideas for turning this big ship um, in your video. And so the video, of course, will be linked in the show notes page for today, workingcows.net slash 273, workingcows.net slash 273 is the show notes page for today. So you can go there, watch Zach's video, and then come here and listen to the long form version of it as well. But uh briefly lay out uh some of the some of the ideas and then we'll come back and we'll we'll dive in on on the ideas uh one at a time so uh, before i do that the one thing i want to highlight is what hasn't worked up to this point um in my opinion and why and that better sets up you know some of my solutions so the things that you know that i'm passionate about right i see the opportunity in this farm bill are to really drive uh, around three things, minimizing, uh, you know, continued soil loss and erosion, water quality and carbon sequestration. Um, And that's what a lot of folks, there's a ton of buzz about that right now and all the talks, how are we going to do this? But the reason that we continue to not make any meaningful progress when you drive across the state of Iowa in the springtime and you only see just a smattering of, you know, for example, cover crop use, you know, which is a visual thing that you can see is because we've taken what's known as, you know, the, the carrot approach, okay, where we're dangling a a prize out in front of the farmer and saying, would you please consider doing this? If you do this, we'll give you something in in return for that. And, um, you know, we, the science is, you know, uh, fairly sound and determined on these things. We know that these things are happening. We know that, you know, we're losing soil, we're losing nitrogen, and we know the things that we have to do to stop it, yet we're not seeing the behavioral change because people are still chasing yield as king and are fearful of any deviation from the the current system that we won't have that. Okay. And so this idea that carrots and and farmers' morality and goodwill is going to guide us, well, we've only, you know, for as an example, looking at cover crop usage uh, since 2008 when the Iowa Nutrient Reduction Strategy went into place and it was something that that 
basically gave a, gave a scoring to what practices could farmers implement that could make the biggest difference in as far as the zone of hypoxia in the Gulf of Mexico. And at number one was cover crops. It was like a 45% reduction of nitrogen mm-hmm. and phosphorus removal on the scale. And so at that time, there was like less than 1% of Iowa that was using them. And now after, you know, 15 years of, you know, having this policy, seeing what that is, we've gone from 1%, I think, to maybe your seven or eight percent now in the state of Iowa. So that's the character. And that that approach has been led by, I would say, probably 80 or 90 percent of those acres are some sort of payment where the farmer is getting paid to to do essentially what is in that farmer's own best interest, which is to preserve the soil and the nutrients and keep them where they belong, which, you know, is, is within their business. Okay. And so this, I, you know, and if we stay on that rate of change, I think I did the math. It's going to take like another 85 years of this, you know, rate of improvement where we would get to a spot where it's actually meaningful. And so my question is, do we have another hundred years of carrot approach where we can wait for change to happen on that timeline. And what is the opportunity cost of that time with soil loss or water degradation or all the other, you know, external things that we're not factoring in. My argument is we don't have time. So to continue on, you know, Einstein's uh, definition of insanity, doing the same thing over expecting a different result, you can't keep applying the same logic, you know, to it. And we may have to do some things that are uncomfortable to people. And uh, so, yeah, so, so here we go. Here are the three ideas that, that, uh, that I've put forward uh, in this video and we'll, we'll talk through them. So, uh, you know, the first idea is around uh, reform and crop insurance. So um, we didn't really explain how crop insurance works, but I'll, I'll do it right now uh, to try to be as succinct as possible. Um, so me as a corn and soybean farmer, um, I can insure my crop up to uh, a certain dollar per acre value. Um, and I pay a premium for that throughout there. There's a cost to that insurance policy, just like there is for car insurance or health insurance or anything else. Uh, the difference with crop insurance is that the taxpayer actually funds my purchase of crop insurance to the tune somewhere between 60 to 65%. The taxpayer is picking up that portion and really uh, is there is no contingencies on me for earning that subsidy. It's just part of the farm bill. You just get that. And uh, when people push back against farmers, like, well, why do you just get that? The argument is, well, you're getting cheap food. So that's, that's where the subsidy and the stabilization has its value. Um, So what I would contend, if we're actually going to fix things, uh, I still think we can produce a lot of food and do it in a sustainable way. So we're really not going to decrease the amount of production. So in order to get people to change, that subsidy should be in order to earn that 62 percent subsidy on average. That has to be driven by behavior of the farmer and what practices on their farm are going to drive a societal good in preserving soil, minimizing erosion, water quality, nutrient management, the same things that are in uh, documents like the Iowa nutrient reduction strategy. You simply come up with a scoring system and whatever practices that you can prove that you are exhibiting and uh, using on your farm, you would earn subsidy points that would get you up to the, you know, maybe you would get back up to that same level if you were doing, um, doing the practices that we know drive those things down. And so the idea is, is that if the taxpayer is going to invest in your farm, the taxpayer should get something in return because, you know, just like you, like who wants the government to be in charge of everything, but somebody, there has to be some sort of governing force that looks for the long-term benefit as society as a whole. Cause we're not all out here living on these individual islands. Once we die, the land passes on. If it's been degraded down to the point of uselessness, what good is it to society at that point? And so the policy needs to put some teeth in it to really get that. And so for me, I mean, that's a significant amount of money that the tax, it's, I think when I did the math, it was, I think this year, uh, close to $35 an acre that the taxpayer was paying um, for my crop insurance uh, policy. So that would be change number one. Okay. Um, yeah. And, and I think that, you know, we, you, you referenced earlier carrots and sticks, right? Like we're always uh, up, opposing like South Dakota Farm Bureau. I'm on the board of South Dakota Farm Bureau. Uh, I think you're involved in Iowa Farm Bureau. Um, you know, we're always opposing the sticks, right? <laughs> uh, but I think what you're talking about here is we're not taking a stick and whacking people with it. We're just taking the stick and we're building a hurdle out of it. And there's a carrot on the other side of that hurdle. If you want to jump the hurdle, you can have that carrot. 
you know, you can have the subsidy for your crop insurance. You can have the equip program, the CSP program. You can have those, but you're going to have to you're going to have to clear the hurdle first. And the hurdle is, you know, uh, wide adoption of of uh, of cover crops on your on your operation. Is that a fair assessment? Yes, that's a fair assessment. And there's all sorts of other examples where we look at things in society, you know, when it comes to, you know, something like food stamps or welfare programs of, well, we want people to, to, to get off their hind end, get off the couch and go try to find a job, you know, and that's the same mantra here. It's not that farmers aren't out working or working a job, but we, we, if we want to earn something that serves the public, we should be forced to, you know, I, I shouldn't say be forced. We should do the things that are not only in the public's interest, but also in our best interest. And with crop insurance, actually, you know, the really interesting things is that when you actually adopt and you're successful with these programs, you know, when you're when you're managing your soil in a way where it's more prone to be able to take a large rain event and have all the water, you know, go into the soil versus running off. Now you're lessening your risk naturally just through management and, you know, lessening the risk of an indemnity payment, you know, for, for the, for the treasury to pay out in the case of a loss. And so. (laughs) And and that runoff, the runoff is never clear, right? The runoff doesn't run off perfectly crystal clear. You can't take your, your cup down to the end of the, where the runoff is happening and scoop out some water and drink it. If you did, it would be full of topsoil because it's taking soil with it. And that's Correct. where the nitrate removal plant in Des Moines comes from is all of the, all of the farm acres that are upstream from Des Moines are they're having runoff and it's taking with it nutrients. Um, I'm guessing, like you said, nitrates and other things with it that they've got to scrub out before the, the water's safe to drink. Is that what's going on there in Des Moines? Um, yeah, in a set, in a nutshell, yes. It's not just runoff. Um, with a lot of the things, you know, are, are naturally going through tile systems, but they're, you know, part of the reason they're doing that is that we only grow a crop four months out of the year and have a living root, uh, for the majority of acres in Iowa. Now, if we had cover crops on all of the acres, you know, would it solve all of our problems? No, I'm not a cover crop purist that like, if everybody plants <laughs> cover crops, all the problems in agriculture are fixed. no. But you can't say that having a live-in root, if you're going to go out and apply hog manure or put hydrous on the 15th of October when soils are 70 degrees like they were this this fall, and people did that, that we wouldn't you know limit our chances of having of keeping you know those assets which we paid for on our farm acre and out of somewhere where they're not of value to us and they're a problem for somebody else. You know the thing that I get wound up about this clay a lot is that so many of these principles are inherently in our own best interests to, you know, work toward uh, that we gain the advantage when we're successful with these things and make our businesses more resilient. And, uh, you know, that's the frustration of myself. And I think other people in this space, when they see the apprehension and like what you said, you know, the, uh, the various lobbying groups, farm bureau, corn growers, like we don't want, you know, we don't want sticks or we don't, we don't want we want to have voluntary efforts. Um, well, that's fine. We're shooting our, how do we, how do we expect the public to keep, you know, trusting us with everything when we're not, sh- you know, showing, uh, having the willpower to do what's inherently in our own best interest that we need to be paid to do those things. I just, I think it's almost an insulting, uh, an insulting premise. Um, and it's, and it's time that we, we do something. And I think that crop insurance, you know, change, it's not popular. I mean, you're not going to find any major group right now that wants that, but if you want to drive a lot of acres, uh, that will get people's attention a hundred percent. If in order to have that eligibility, that subsidy, they need to do something, um, that will drive things. <laughs> yeah, it will, it will definitely make a difference. So that's number one, right? Uh, yep, yep. what's number two? So, you know, I've, there's, there's three solutions here that I think, uh, that solve a lot of this. Number two could be the most important one. Um, and that is uh, landowners have to have the skin in the game. You cannot put all the onus on just the farmer to take the risk in making these changes if the landowner could potentially pull the rug out. Part of the problem our system has is, you know, we have these, uh, you know, a certain percentage of land that's owned and operated by the farmer. And then I think a majority of farms, um, you know, are, are rented. They're short term rental agreements. So there's not a lot of longevity to those things. And comfort for farmers to make changes and then have the rug pulled out from underneath on the lease. Um, so, and we have in 
increased land ownership further and further away removed from the farm. So we're a couple of generations from some of these farm families that are maybe inheriting farms and they live in, you know, who knows where Kansas city, Denver, Des Moines in an urban area. And the only concern they have about the farm is getting the rent check on March 1st and December 1st and not much interest in what's actually happening out there. And so there needs to be, something for them to pay attention in how their land is being managed. And it's, again, it's in their best interest. It's their, it's their asset. You don't want to have a, you know, no other asset of that value would you hold and not worry about, is this thing degrading? Okay. Um, but we really don't have good ways to measure that or people don't think about it in those constructs. So anyway, what I, the point I'm trying to make is we need to apply the same metric that we had to crop insurance as far as earning the subsidy to whether or not an additional land use tax should be paid by landowners to fund water quality initiatives. And again, just like crop insurance, it gives people the choice. If you don't want to do this on your land, the government is not going to force you to do it. Okay. But you have to realize that it does make a difference. There are external costs that we currently do not internalize within the system that have to be realized if we're going to be taken seriously. And that cost has to be paid from somewhere. And so if landowners want to make the changes, then we would leave things as they are. But then we if but if not, and they're not going to do that or take interest in that, um, you know, we would come up with some sort of a, a property tax that would go to funding, uh, you know, state or federal water quality initiatives uh, for cleaning up the, the zone of hypoxia or operating nitrate removal plants or, you know, uh, cleaning dredge ditches, uh, you know, that happened in local waterways around uh, uh, us all the time uh, where we get erosion silting them in. Um, you know, they're, 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 we have to have landowners uh, on the hook. And I tell you what, if landowners uh, are going to get a tax bill at the end of the year assessed based off practices, that is going to drive hard finding tenants to be in place to make sure to minimize their tax liability. Now, people don't, you know, initially I thought, well, this should be a tax cut, uh, you know, and uh, you and I actually had that conversation offline. Um, but if you took that, I, I actually uh, uh, positioned that to a legislator a few years ago and they're like, well, we already, you know, what else am I going to cut if I don't have that revenue coming in, you know, to offset that. And so, uh, and so, yeah, and that, that's a fair point. Uh, you know, budgets are tough to deal with on all those things. So I, just make it additive. And when you put an additive tax and that really gets, people's uh, attention if they have to spend more than what they're currently used to. And so, um, again, this is not going to be a, a real popular uh, opinion at the State Farm Bureau Convention. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you and I both know that. So, but um, it, it addresses the, you know, the elephant in the room that you have to have both the farmer and the land owner with skin in the game um, when you're trying to solve this problem. Yes. And it's voluntary. I mean, it is voluntary. Uh, ultimately, you are volunteering to not adopt these practices, so you're volunteering to have higher taxes. You are volunteering not to adopt these practices, so you're volunteering to pay more of your crop insurance uh, premium yourself, basically, right? I mean, that's Correct. that's ultimately what it is. I, I think that that uh, carrot with a hurdle <laughs> <laughs> is Correct. is a helpful way of thinking about it uh, because there's rationalizing on all sides. No matter what we do, there's going to be rationalizing. They have rationalized the fact that the American taxpayer can be on the hook for 60% of the crop insurance premium because they're getting cheap food. Well, we're rationalizing that there's a there's a carrot with a hurdle between you and it, and it's, it's a way to uh, drive change quicker than just the carrot alone. And so uh, I think it's I think it's a reasonable approach. So anything else to say on number two? No, I think that's it. And we go on to number three. Number three is also one that will uh, uh, upset things, but it's, it's important to mention because it's a, a big reason why change doesn't occur. And that's that a strong majority of uh, American farm operations are controlled uh, by people at or beyond uh, retirement age. And when you are at that age and someday within 20 years, I will be there too. The older you get, the more that you resist change. It's a, it's human nature. It's a natural phenomenon. It doesn't make you a bad person. Um, but you get to that point in your life and you don't want to take risks. It's like me with my kids, 529 college plan. Like it's, you know, I don't want to risk that. And the stock market is scaring me right now with that. So I want to 
play things safe to the vest to make sure that that's there. The same principle is when you get to that age. The, the problem, though, that I've seen over my career in retail is that we have too many uh, operations that are have a decision making uh, that is uh, under a stranglehold by this older generation that does not want to move into tomorrow with these things. And I've seen, I've had guys that are 65 years old come up to me and say, Hey, I love the things that you're doing. It makes a ton of sense. If I was your age, I'd be all over top of that stuff. But I just, I don't have enough time to see the benefit and I just not that interested. I want to kind of coast. And so I'm not going to do it or there'll be, maybe they have a son or a daughter interested and uh, they want to change, but you know what? They only are farming a couple hundred acres and they don't have the clout to make the decision to deploy the capital that it takes. That's still dependent on dad or grandpa, you know, or there's the, the adage of, you know, what is, is making this change going to take somebody's job away? I mean, if you have grandpa or uncle Harold from in town, come out and run the ripper in the fall. And that's that, you know, gives, uh, you know, their wives sanities to get them out of the house to do something. Uh, you know, that, that, I mean, that sounds silly, but that is a real factor for, for like, where is the usefulness for if you're going to eliminate need for, you know, for certain tasks and this stuff. So, um, but so with that in mind, so how do you, how do you address that? Well, to me, it's really simple. I think once you're eligible to, uh, to start re- uh, you know, receiving, uh, social security payments, you know, tied to retirement, um, you should be off the, the government dole when it comes to receiving, uh, any form of USDA subsidy. Um, and you know, that will, uh, you know, speed up that process or the impotence of, uh, trying to transition to a younger generation that is going to be hungrier to employ the change because they're more likely to see it throughout the course. Um, and then, you know, do it at an earlier age after, you know, 62 so that the, you know, the next generation is in their thirties and forties rather than taking over power of the farm in their fifties and sixties. And now all of a sudden you just have this perpetual, well, I'm too old to change cycle going on all the time. And so I think if we did that and, uh, and, and tip the scales, you know, if, if by the age of 62, if you're not ready to get off um, government assistance in managing risk on your farming operation, um, you know, that's, I'm sorry, that's too bad, uh, I guess, at that point. But we need we need to have something on the backside of the system to encourage uh, transfer into, um, you know, young, a younger generation that's going to implore or employ the change that we're talking about. And I think that we are in a unique situation and a unique circumstance with as many people farming well into their 70s and 80s as are farming well into their 70s and 80s right now. This is a new thing. This hasn't happened before in, I would say, in human history. Um, You know, because another thing is that we're on a really, really small time scale as it is, right? I mean, like, this whole industrialization of farming and, and the people covering as many acres as they do is really new, like, since World War II that a lot of that stuff has started to really ramp up as far as the number of acres and as far as the the lack of the lack of rotation and biodiversity and and the integration of livestock a lot of that has happened i would say since world war 2 and i think that's being generous i would say it's probably even less time than that i think that you go back to world war 2 in iowa you probably saw more than just corn and soybeans and no livestock integration there was there was probably quite a bit more as far as a rotation is concerned and some integration of livestock. Is that, is that accurate? I'm, I'm never, I've been through <laughs> Iowa. haven't spent any I've time. Watched there. It, yeah. I've w- I watched it change in my lifetime. So right. there were a lot of diversified farms when I was growing up as a kid. Um, most of the kids in my class came from farm families. Uh, majority of them did. Um, they were diversified in our neck of the woods. Everybody had corn, uh, soybeans, usually some, uh, some oats or alfalfa. Uh, and then usually b- about every farm had hogs, you know, during the eighties in Iowa hogs were, you know, referred to as the mortgage lifter, the help, you know, hogs were usually good when everything else wasn't. Mm. Um, and, but that continued on till about the late nineties. And then we had, uh, I think it was eight cent hogs uh, that year. And, and that pushed the last of kind of the independent uh, class or the majority of independents out. And then that's when you saw the onset of, uh, uh, a lot of the CAFO, uh, construction and, and farmers no longer being independent hog producers, but, you know, essentially being a, a worker for the, the larger integrator, um, and providing labor and getting manure in return. So, I mean, it, there's been a, there's been a huge shift in 
in what I would call farmer sovereignty. And I think, especially in the livestock side of things, we've seen that, but I think it's coming to the crop side increasingly quickly, um, especially with the consolidation and this kind of ramping up at scale. And one of the things I like about these changes, I do think it does put a natural break um, on some of the, you know, the, the, the idea that we should only have, you know, uh, a, a farm operation in every county in the state of Iowa in, in 30 or 40 years, it's farming a quarter million acres. Like, is that, is it going to be possible to farm at that scale and farm in a way that, you know, talks about the things that are, that we've been talking about that are important. I don't think so because I, I, I have some very good friends who are very, very good large scale commodity operators and they would like to make these changes, but they just don't know how from the complexities of operating, you know, a mega ship like that, how to do that um, with, because a lot of the things that we do that have negative externalities make that system work, you know? And so nobody wants to go backwards. And so that's another resistance uh, to that whole thing. But again, it's the p farm policy that has driven it. It's not, you know, it's not the greedy farmer. The farmer is just playing the hand that they're, they're being dealt, you know? And so we have to have the bravery, uh, our political leaders, our industry leaders, you know, we have to stop, you know, do we, we have all of these folks, Clay, that, that stand up and talk about how great we are and all these things that we are doing and we are the stewards and we're current. If we're not going to do that and we're just going to continue on the same path, let's just at least stop saying those things and saying we're really for cheap food at all costs and stop the grandstanding. I'd be fine with that. What I can't stand is the hypocrisy for saying we are these things. And then we're putting policy in place where we want carrots and we don't, we want voluntary action and insist that that's going to be the difference in the future. It's not, it's nonsense. You know, history tells us that is absolute nonsense and we need, we need bravery by these leaders. And that's why I may, I put this video out hoping that maybe it would get into somebody's hands that uh, a corn and soybean farmer from Iowa uh, thinks that there is a viable path and challenges those folks to think that way. Yeah. Yep. And, and wh what are, um, why now? Why, why release this video now? What, what was the motivation? Um, I don't know. This stuff's been boiling. I mean, I've been thinking about the, the 2023 farm bill for the last year and knowing it was coming and, uh, I, I, it's kind of like what I just alluded to. I see a lot of grandstanding by, uh, the folks that are in power, the, the industry groups, the politicians, and it's a, it's all kind of meaningless and it's time to, to call people on the carpet and time to put up or shut up. And if you really believe in these things, or you say that this stuff's possible, show us that you're willing to do the hard work, make some people uncomfortable, but actually actually get it done, you know? And, and for a lot of people, these changes, this is an important point, like, you know, there's going to be a lot of people that are looking at farm bill policy and saying, well, this doesn't go nearly far enough. You know, we have all this other stuff to solve, but we want to restore everything back to the way it was, you know, uh, 75 years ago with all these local food systems and, um, you know, restoring things back to indigenous peoples. And all of those things are great and important. It would be great to do that stuff. I 100 percent agree. But we have to look at the reality of where we're at right now and what is something meaningful that we could do. Uh, you know, in the near term to address, in my opinion, what is the most important thing? And that is uh, addressing, you know, the loss of soil, soil quality and the sustainability of our food system for the long term. Let's get that stuff and get the policy right to get us pointed in the right direction. And then we will be able to start solving those other things when people see that when they adopt these things, that it is not the Antichrist. OK, and it is not the threat that they believe it to be. And their minds will be more open to some of these other things that could potentially further improve agriculture um, down the down the road. And that's that, that's something that some people don't want to hear. But, you know, yeah, there's 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 uh, there's the real world and all these other spheres that that people operate in. And some people are probably saying, well, you're not in the real world, Zach, either right now. Uh, maybe you're right. Uh, but, uh, uh, I'm, I'm naive and hopeful that we, we still have, uh, have the potential to do these things. And that's why, that's why I appreciate you having me on to, to, to talk more in a long form about it. It's, uh, sure. it's good. It's good therapy for me, if nothing else. Clay. <laughs> so is it, is it, 
um, something to do with varieties of seed that are that have closed this feedback loop where we just keep seeing higher and higher yields, even though we're doing it on lower and lower quality soils. Is that what's going on? Why, you know, I mean, it seems like, well, yield is yield is king. So if my yield's better, everything must be better. When we, you and I, I guess, would probably say that's not true. Like there isn't as much topsoil everywhere in Iowa as there used to be at one time. And so is it, what is it, what's driving that, uh, I I guess, what's keeping that feedback loop from, from making the connection? The, the advancements in seed and what the seed companies have done is nothing short of a miracle. You know, you look at a year, you know, so, I mean, people want to demonize companies like, uh, you know, Corteva and Bear with uh, the, you know, this, their research and what it's pr- proven. You look in a drought year, like what we did in Northern Iowa and other places that were really, really dry compared to, you know, back in 1988, unbelievable the difference in outcomes, okay, that we've been able to overcome with that stuff. So there's there's the difference in the research and the genetics, you know, which definitely has value. But then there's all the other inputs that were the synthetic inputs that we've gotten better at figuring out how to pour the coals to the, the natural system. Now, so if the combination of that technology technology with within the seed the genetics improving and you know farmers managing things to a higher degree with these you know the synthetic inputs coming in that's all well and good okay my question is can that go on forever can you continue to have a degraded medium that you're growing things in and will technology outpace that now if you listen to ag industry people they will say well absolutely i just don't think that happens because if we've looked in you know again the students of history would say there's lots of examples where we outkicked our coverage. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I feel like, you know, I feel we're getting close, uh, to that line and, and, you know, why would we want to toe the line? I guess if we have alternatives where we can still grow a lot of things and be successful and not be in the poor house and make, you know, what we're passing on, leaving it in better shape than we found it. Yep. Very good. What about, um, if you, would you pick one first, one over the other, would you pick, would you say one of these if you if you if they say okay we can do one of these we can't do all three this year we can do one this year would you pick one over the other <laughs> uh, yes i would um and that's a good question uh it would probably be the the land tax because that would impact everyone um every landowner would wake up to that no landlord at the end of the year especially if you're retired and depending on the income is going to want to pay more um, and, and also if you're a farmer yourself and you're a landowner, I think that's going to, to drive, drive that change. But I, I really think it is going to take, there is no, I mean, people love to apply like a silver bullet, like that's going to just address like in all systems and situations. And a lot of times in agriculture, we're looking for that silver bullet, you know, just like with soil health, you think if we do cover crops, it's all fixed. It's not, you have, it's a, everything is an ecological holistic system. And you have to think about what are the, what are the things that contribute to all these things? And that's why I put these, you know, these three things for, I think they're the most impactful um, or the, the way that would drive comprehensive change rapidly so that we could get to, you know, 80, 90% of the landscape being managed in a much more, you know, sustainable way. Any pushback from the video yet? Have you heard any negative feedback or anything like that? Uh, I've had uh, a couple, I've only had one or two comments, uh, negative on YouTube, um, which is easier because it's not as public as what Twitter pushback is, but no, I've, I'm kind of surprised that I haven't, uh, had more pushback. I, the video or the tweet itself, I was thanks to, uh, the t- changes to Twitter. I see that it's been had 32,000 impressions. Uh, um, and so it's, it's gone a long ways. Um, it's been retweeted by a lot of people. And, uh, so I appreciate, you know, folks, uh, folks spreading it and, um, uh, you know, and I'm sure, uh, I'm sure some of it, people just don't want to respond publicly. I'm sure, you know, there's, uh, people in bars over christmas talking about you know you see that what zach that idiot smith zach smith said what's what's he trying to do to to wreck the party here and and that's 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 fine uh but uh no i haven't had anybody call me out and if somebody wants to i'm you know i'm i'm not i'm not opposed to having the conversation and maybe there's something i'm not thinking about i'm not that uh, i'm not that hold up on my opinions that i couldn't adapt or you know, i just want progress that's the only thing and if, if we can work together to find ways to bring meaningful change i'm game for that conversation 
Yeah, we've tried the other things. Let's try something else. You know, that's kind of yes. again. We've let's hit the pinata, see if some candy comes out. Maybe it does. Maybe yep. it doesn't. If it doesn't, we'll try another stick. <laughs> oh anyways all right zach anything else that you wanted to share or any any other way you wanted to uh hit uh any of these any of these three topics no i i think uh i I appreciate you you having on it it is nice to have the long form uh, much more so than a youtube video or a a tweet to try to cat this is all complicated stuff it's dynamic it hits everybody different you know this is my perspective as a corn and soybean farmer um and you know with an interest uh in soil conservation and actually seeing stuff and there there is a a group of people you know there are quite a few farmers out there that share uh this you know uh ideal system and think this work is important a lot of them have reached out to me appreciate those folks for being supportive you do feel like you're kind of putting your neck on the line when you when you put stuff like this out in the world um because you know there's a lot of people that aren't going to like it and um you never know what's going to come from that so uh, especially in this day and age but i i uh i just you know i think i want people in agriculture moving forward to be thoughtful about what we're doing and realize it's a big world and we've got to figure out how to exist with everyone uh you know, within the system, not only in our own ecosystem, but the people that we are feeding and, and, and be realistic and, and honest, uh, about what it is we do and, uh, and the products that we produce. Yeah. Do you feel like crop insurance acts as a barrier from people adopting, uh, out of the box pr- uh, practices, uh, innovative practices? Is there, is there something that says, no, you can't do cover crops and corn, Uh, on the same acres as far as, you know, that's just one example, but do you think it, it happens that way? I think like we touched on earlier, um, yes, there used to be some of that where there were um, resistances around uh, termination timelines for crops like corn as far as when, but some of those things have been augmented, uh, you know, and I think even with uh, things like relay cropping now, um, are there's coverage for some of those. So there have been made improvements, uh, you know, to that, which is great. And I, and I hope that RMA is, uh, continues to be, you know, as some of these new kind of outside of the box, uh, ideas come forward that they, they act quickly on it. Uh, because I, the more diversity that, you know, the bottom line is the more diversity that we can get out here on the landscape and get things more diverse than just corn and soybeans and hog barns and cattle feedlots where everything is separated and really not integrated. Um, you know, the trans, you know, that, that the major change that we talked about earlier, you know, that's really where I want to get pointed to, or, you know, similar to like the stock cropper system, we're using things in concert, the natural world with technology to, you know, form a better outcome. And, uh, you know, we're just not going to get there in one step. Uh, but we, the first step, like what we've been talking about is to acknowledge these problems, do something meaningful, at least within the current paradigm so that we can open the doors to see the light to walk toward, you know, for the, for the next steps in getting there. Yeah. Very good. I think that's a good place to wrap it up. Uh, Zach, thanks for your time today. Yeah. Thanks for the opportunity, Clay. As always, uh, very good stuff there with Zach. Uh, he mentioned the stock cropper. Uh, some of the links to the previous episodes that we've done with Zach will be in the show notes page for today. Again, workingcows.net slash 273. Uh, you can go there and find that. I uh, really appreciate Zach and his time today. Uh, coming up next week on the Working Cows podcast, really looking forward to a conversation with John Haskell. Recently, I was uh, was the MC or was hosting uh, a ranching for profit webinar. And John was a guest on there. John was, was an attendee of the webinar really. And he had some really interesting stuff to say about structuring your business to fit your life stage. Like uh, when we're younger, let's do a more labor intensive business that we can uh, do well. But then when we're older and we're looking to, uh, shield ourselves from some risk and some tax uh, liabilities. Let's structure our businesses that way as well. And so uh, really looking forward to that conversation with John Haskell coming up next week on the Working Cows podcast with the first episode of the new year. Uh, Merry Christmas, everybody. A day light, and we'll see you in the new year. We invite you to visit workingcows.net to subscribe to the show via iTunes or Stitcher. You'll also find detailed show notes pages, resources from our guests, and the industry leaders who have influenced them. For more ideas on putting your cows to work for you in a more profitable way, tune in next week.